huge walls where you can just write something on your ideas and so on. And there will be a brainstorming. I guess uh, something I just will ask you something about it because it won't work now. Um, what do we have to expect in the brainstorming? Um, as we have mentioned at the beginning of the festival, we would also like to start here with our activities. And one is about uh, sustainable development in STEM education. And we have this meeting at one o'clock. It's a brainstorming meeting and it's in room, now we have the slide, it's in room six. And we would like to invite you to try in this meeting and here you will get further information about the project and um, the um, application deadline for this project is the end of November. And then we have a coordinators team and people can join in. This project will last for two years. So this is one of the next upcoming projects at Science Stage. And then we have another one for primary school teachers because they are playing an important role at Science Stage. So if you would like to stay in touch with colleagues and think about ways how to address primary teachers in your countries, then we invite you also at one o'clock to come to room five. If you're interested in both meetings, then it's a little bit difficult, but um, yeah, you have to make a choice. And um, you will find also uh, information about this uh, if you go to the Science of State Europe stand. So please uh, come there. And also what Sebastian was already saying in the morning, this teacher exchange is really important to us. We think we have to find now here a teacher with whom we would like to continue to work with. Make the contact here and fill in the form. We will back to uh, the Science of State Europe stand. Because once you are home, then it's more difficult. And um, yeah, this was just saying, uh, stay in touch with us and think about the follow-up activities. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Okay, now, Martin. <laughs> oh, Rosa is showing me something? No, 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 okay, I think it's okay. So, Martin, you're up on stage. And uh, you mentioned all those funny things when you like, Woo! Yes, exactly. That's the sound Martin lives in. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, well, we are we're living in wonderful times, you know. Yesterday, um, there started to, uh, three machines, three huge detectors. Um, they so called the LIGO detectors and the RIGO detectors. They're all like, no, they're working now for 19 hours now, I guess. So, and um, it's their second, second um, session of detection, or the third. Uh, session of detection. But I won't tell you anything about it now because it's Martin's job. So, <laughs> welcome on stage. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I missed the dinner. I missed the dinner because these three detectors began operating again last night. But I'm here to tell you of some of the exciting science we've been doing in the last few years and how you can share that with your students and your pupils in school. So, um, I want to talk, well, this one isn't working, we can build a gravitational wave detector but we can't get the projector to work. Ah, uh, that's annoying. Can anyone in the tech room help us here? The clicker is not working. I'll have to be really old fashioned and say, could I have the next slide please? Um, can anyone back there help? Excellent, okay, but of course it's advanced too fast. And so uh, they, they've got it back to where we want to be. Excellent, so this is a, a, a short talk about Einstein. And as you can see, Einstein and me go back a long way. This is a photograph of the statue in Washington, where I always try to pay a visit, like a pilgrimage, every time I'm in DC, to go see the statue of Einstein. Einstein is probably the most famous scientist in recent times, you can argue if it should be Newton or indeed scientists from other fields. But um, the fame of Einstein is renowned around the world. And in fact, in 1999, Time magazine voted him not just the scientist of the century, but the person of the century. I should add though, this was the editorial board's decision. There was a public vote too, and the public voted for Elvis Presley. 
So you can decide for yourself, you've got that one correct. So Einstein is, of course, a giant in our field of science. What exactly did Einstein learn about the universe? Well, probably the most high profile discovery is this one. His theory of general relativity, his ideas about gravity. And you can sum them up in a lot of different ways. One way that I use a lot in schools outreach because it's very accessible is to think of space time that we live in as like a stretched sheet of rubber, like a trampoline. And that gravity curves space time. And consequently, that's why the moon orbits the Earth, why the Earth orbits the Sun, and so on. So gravitational waves fit into that picture because when the curve of space-time is changing, it sends ripples out through the universe that we call gravitational waves. Now technically that means when I wave my hand like this, like I was nearly going to do to the tech guys to get my presentation working, I'm producing gravitational waves because this is a massive body being accelerated. But because my, well, you know, I'm more massive than I used to be, but I'm still not as massive as a star, and I'm still not accelerating my fist close to the speed of light. And that tells us that space-time is incredibly stiff. You may not have thought of that before, but it's true. Space-time is really stiff. We need massive stars colliding or exploding to shake up space-time enough to produce those ripples out there deep in the universe. And what makes it even more challenging is that they get weaker as they spread out through the universe like ripples on a pond. So by the time they reach us from, say, two colliding black holes out there deep in the universe, let's face it, you don't want that happening in your backyard, so the chances are those two colliding black holes will be very far away. By the time the ripples reach us, they disturb our patch of space-time by a tiny, tiny amount, less than a thousandth the size of a proton the subatomic particle in the heart of the nucleus of an atom. Or to give us something more every day to think about, they disturb our patch of space-time by about one million millionth the width of one of your hairs. So the challenge to detect gravitational waves, and the reason why it took us a hundred years to do it, is can we measure those tiny disturbances? Well, yes we can. As Barack Obama once said, there are two detectors in the US which began operating in 2015 with the required sensitivity to pick up those space-time ripples. They're called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories. And as we heard, there's another detector now operating in Europe called Virgo, close to Pisa in Italy. And LIGO operates using laser light to measure those tiny changes in the shape of space-time. The LIGO observatories are huge, the arms of the interferometer are four kilometers long, and Virgo's only a little smaller, three kilometer arms for the Virgo detector. And the purpose of that L shape is to pick up changes in the shape of space-time at this incredibly tiny level. The laser light is split into two, and it goes along each arm, bounces off a mirror, comes back again, and when it's recombined, that laser light carries an imprint of a passing gravitational wave because it stretches and squeezes space-time by different amounts along each arm. Now, having the sensitivity to detect those tiny changes, a million million the width of a hair, is only part of the solution. Because, of course, our universe is full, we now know, of gravitational waves, but our local patch of the universe is full of many other disturbances. Everything from trucks driving by, to scientists pounding along the corridor, to clouds passing overhead, changing the gravitational field. So this is why you need at least two detectors. It wasn't buy one, get one free from the National Science Foundation, <laughs> but having two detectors was crucial because that helps us to separate local disturbances, what we call noise, from the real deal, the gravitational wave signals out there in the cosmos. So one of the classroom activities we do in LIGO is a kind of game to play with that idea of how hard it is to detect signals against background noise. So come talk to me later in the day and we can chat about how you might do that. It doesn't need any science as such, it doesn't need any physics or maths, it just needs noisy school children and I'm sure you have plenty of those to go around. 
So, what happened in 2015? We heard in the introduction that sounded you well. I've even got the date on my t-shirt to make sure I don't forget. But really, I'll never forget that date because it's one of the most significant days in my career as a scientist. What happened was that our detectors had been upgraded, they'd been improved. We went from initial LIGO, which didn't detect anything for several years, to advanced LIGO. And my institute in Glasgow had a large part in making the detectors more sensitive. What we had to do was to stop the mirrors from wobbling so much at the ends of those arms, so that they were as still as possible and listening for those tiny ripples coming from deep in the universe. And on September 14th of 2015, the mirrors newly improved, less um, susceptible to those local noises and more able to listen to the signals from deep in the cosmos. Well, this is what we found. You can maybe just make out that chirp sound like we were all doing before. In fact, we're playing it twice because firstly, the deep rumble is the real signal. In fact, mainly noise, in fact, buried within that signal is more like a cosmic thud than a cosmic chirp. But we shift the signal to slightly higher frequencies to make it easier for our ears to hear. We're also playing it over and over again because that helps us perhaps to pick the signal out. But in reality, the signal lasted for only a tiny fraction of a second, and then it was gone, sweeping past the Earth, spreading out to the rest of the universe. It took us five months to be absolutely sure that we'd found truly a cosmic gravitational wave signal. So the announcement we made on February the 11th, 2016, and you probably know this won the Nobel Prize for Physics for three senior members of our collaboration in December 2017. So what had we discovered about our universe? We interpreted this signal as the collision of two massive black holes more than a billion light years away. So that signal had been spreading through the universe for more than a billion years, sweeping past the LIGO detectors, disturbing them ever so slightly, and then carrying on through the universe. Here we see the pattern. What we were hearing before is the sound, and they represented as two graphs. They seem to match very well. That's despite Livingston and Hanford being 3,000 kilometers apart. And we can interpret that signal as the indication that those two black holes collided, moving at more than half the speed of light, and just a few hundred kilometers apart, what we call a few times the sparks child radius of the black hole. Now, one of the things we also learned is that this signal, as I said, happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, more than a billion light years away. And by analyzing the data, we can reconstruct that collision and how space-time, the stretched rubber sheet I mentioned before, was being distorted ever more violently by these approaching black holes. And as they merge, we get a burst of gravitational wave energy released perhaps in just a small fraction of a second. And the amount of energy released was equivalent to three times the mass of our sun. And we can turn that into an energy using Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. And then we can turn that into a power by dividing the energy by how much time it took to release that energy. And this gravitational wave power was released very probably with no light of any sort being released at the same time. Because gravitational waves are not light waves, they're a different kind of radiation altogether. So in a real sense, we're probing the dark side of the universe. And if we do the calculation, the power released in gravitational wave energy from the dark side of the universe was more power than about 50 times the light power released by every star and every galaxy in the entire universe. It was only released for a fraction of a second, but that tells us how much energy there is locked up in space-time. In a sense, it tells us that you should never underestimate the dark side, the power of the dark side of the universe, as Darth Vader might say. It also tells us that if we could ever tap in 
to that energy of space time, it would be unimaginably huge amounts of energy. Perhaps we'll never be able to do that. But if we do, then those hoverboards we heard about are absolutely on the to-do list. <laughs> Anyhow, we've discovered many more sources since then. We've published 10 black hole binary mergers, just like, a little bit like the first one. And we've also discovered the merger of two neutron stars, a different kind of compact star, the remnant of a massive star that goes supernova, but not quite so massive as a black hole. And those neutron stars were very special. This was in August 2017, because we also saw from them a flash of gamma rays, what we call a gamma ray burst. And the gravitational wave signal and the, ga the gamma ray signal arrived at almost exactly the same time, even though they set off 140 million light years away. So here's an artist's impression of the neutron stars colliding and shaking up space-time in a violent way. And then later, we get that gamma ray flash. And that combination of gravity and light lets us answer lots of deep questions about the universe. Everything from the origin of the heaviest metals like and gold and platinum and silver to measuring how fast our universe is expanding. So what's happening now, just to wrap things up, as we heard, our detectors are back online. So our second science run ended in August 2017 and then we spent some time upgrading the detectors, making them more sensitive. We came back online on April 1st, 2019 and we operated for six months and then we had a month off in October to improve the detectors a little bit more. The big change for our third observing run that we're now halfway through is that when we think we have a candidate event, we tell the world right away. Not like in 2050 where everything was top secret for five months until we made a public announcement. Now we want astronomers around the world to go look for a light counterpart straight away. So we put those candidates out on social media, on our web pages, and they're attracting a lot of attention. And if you want to follow these alerts as they come in, there's a new app that we just launched yesterday from the collaboration. Our colleagues in Birmingham University have led this, and it's available now for free on the Google and Play and App Store. So, so far in that first six months, we've seen 33 more candidate events. More black hole collisions, more neutron star collisions, and possibly a collision of a neutron star and a black hole. That one happened in August and has already attracted a lot of attention, but it's still just a candidate. And we're still going through all the rigorous checks that you need to to verify if this one is real too. But if we are seeing exotic events like neutron stars being swallowed by black holes, well, who knows? what more questions they might help us to answer in the future. So, the next stage of our quest to understand gravitational waves is to build more detectors. There's one about to begin operation in Japan later this year, and then there's also a new instrument that's beginning construction in India, and it will be essentially a copy of the two LIGO detectors in the US. The more detectors you have, the better you can pinpoint on the sky where those gravitational waves are coming from. And that helps us to track down an accompanying signal in light. So the next few years, hopefully we'll see maybe hundreds more detections. And looking slightly further down the line, we are going to even have gravitational wave detectors in space. So I'm around all day. Please do come along and chat about what's been happening, how we communicate that science, in um, formal and informal education and we have lots of resources to help you do that. Our website has magazines, has what we call science summaries which present the main science results in an accessible way. Lots of multimedia too. So here's those science summaries for example. We've got some recent ones that aren't just about the detections but how you analyse the data. And the data is available in many cases with simple computer notebooks, Python notebooks, so that your students could play around with it for themselves. So you can also follow our YouTube channel and follow us on social media.
So going back to those first collisions, <laughs> one of the ideas that we thought would capture the excitement of our discoveries was our so-called in-spiral toast, where the glasses orbit each other and then collide. It gets harder to do the more often you do it, <laughs> but it really is a lot of fun. And I hope in this very short presentation I've given you a sense of the bright future that lies ahead for gravitational wave astrophysics, and I look forward to enjoying a few inspired toasts with some of you later. Thank you very much.